So I guess let's let's dive into that here. This concept of borders and how it, it's amazing to me. You know, it, of course we're we're constantly thinking about uh, like Israel right now and Gaza and and just how people so can can so quickly treat these uh, political structures that we've decided on as something that just came out of nature. I mean, Biden's older than the state of Israel, but we have to we have to talk about Israel as as this incredibly important thing to maintain. ICE was created after 9/11. And AOC is apparently radical for when she ran on uh, uh, abolishing ICE, right? And a lot of members of the squad. But but that's not radical because we're just looking back a few decades at this point. And what your book uh talks about is how border walls and these the the these detention centers and closed borders in this way are a relatively new phenomenon um can you talk about the history of uh, militarized borders and how it rapidly has kind of escalated over the past six or seven decades yeah so there's a number of ways you can look at this. In the year 2000, shortly before 9-11, there were about 15 militarized border walls throughout the world. Today, there's just under 80. So we have seen an incredible explosion of, of border enforcement throughout the world. And that number is still rising. There's, there's more being planned. You mentioned ICE. ICE has only been around since 2003. For 95% of our country's history, we had no ICE. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people who say things like, without a border, you can't have a country. Or without this sort of intense enforcement regime, um, we wouldn't be able to maintain the status quo of the country. But this is all very new. We have had, we had effectively no real border infrastructure like walls or fences before the 1990s there were some there was some that started in the 80s but really what we see today is over 700 miles of wall um, about 20,000 a little under 20,000 border officials border patrol uh, officials none of that was around that i mean it, it was like incomparable and yet you know things seemed you know were, were far from perfect and there's plenty of uh, you know, suffering along the border. And there's a lot of people who, you know, had more difficulties crossing than others. And sometimes it was it was really bad, but nothing like what we're seeing today. In fact, for the first 100 plus years of our country's history, there was zero federal immigration laws on the books, zero. So it's possible, um, you know, abolish ICE is something that we don't have to go that far back in our history to, to, to see that we could we could exist without it. And yet, I think that people sort of fall into this trap of the status quo or the status quo bias where exactly as you're saying, like all of a sudden it seems unimaginable or like anathema to what a country is to, to see beyond these walls. But we also have lots of examples throughout the world of places where there are no walls or where there is effectively open immigration. Of course, the EU is probably the first thing that comes to mind. And there's a lot of fears especially in Western Europe, about what would happen if they opened up this passport-free zone. And none of those fears were realized. My own family comes from Romania, from Eastern Europe. That was one of the one of the later countries that was tacked onto this free passport zone. A lot of people were like, all the Romanians are going to come to Spain or France, and we're really nervous about it. And yet that didn't happen. Actually, a lot of the migration from Eastern Europe to Western Europe stayed the same or even slowed down to some degree. Um, you know, so there's like, I think a lot of fear that is uh, not really warranted about what could happen or what things could look like. There's also all of this seemingly amnesia of what things looked like before. And there's another, I think, really important thing here is like, when people advocate for walls, at least the status quo, or maybe even more walls or more miles of walls or higher walls or whatever, or blacker walls, like Trump wants to paint them black or dig moats around the country as well. One thing that is often left out of the conversation is how ineffective they are. They really don't work very well, or they don't work to do what they're purported to do. People have always migrated. They're migrating now, and they will migrate in the future. I think the real question is not how to stop them, because we can't, and we can get into that a little bit, 
but how do we respond to people moving? And I think if you sort of just change the framing on that question a little bit, I think it brings up a little bit more of understanding and the humanity that's involved in the issue. It's like, okay, it's inevitable that people are gonna come. So do we wanna give them the boot or make their lives miserable or break apart their families and try to excommunicate them? Or can we say like, we can't stop them. So maybe we can make it better for all of us. And there's a lot that we could talk about there too about how yeah. migration is a huge boon for, for all. For all, Wrong. yes, and, and 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 the fact that we can't stop them is in part due to the fact that there has been an escalation in displacement. In part due to, like, it, I want to get to the United States in a second, and we can talk about how U.S. policy in in Latin and South America results in the displacement. But you mentioned Europe there, and um, I, it is notable. Because within the EU, right, there's very free movement country to country and you can go for a weekend to another country by train. But for some of these countries that now have far right governments, I mean, Georgia Maloney comes to mind in Italy, they are obsessed with preventing certain kinds of people from entering the country. Migrants they're, the, uh, coming across the sea. Maloney has been defunding these kind of NGO organizations that are responsible for rescuing them to just force them to, to drown. Um, so can you talk about that like very obvious incongruence where, hey, other people who kind of look like us from other European countries can freely come and visit. But if we're having migration from African countries or Middle Eastern countries, time for them to drown in the ocean. Right. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's worse than incongruence. You're right. It is also that. But it's blatant hypocrisy and racism. Yes. You know, take Italy as an example. And it's a really telling example. For well over a century, Italy was a country of huge emigration. Many, many Italians left, primarily the United States. Um, look at Germany as well. Germany, especially in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, was a place of that was sending a lot of people to different countries. Again, mostly the United States, but many other places as well. And a lot of them were not met with open arms. Um, they were reviled. They were, you know, uh, slurred. They were, you know, slurs were cast on them. Um, they were trying to push back. And yet, Italians, you know, they were, you know, crying foul about their their treatment. And yet, they didn't stop leaving because of poverty, because of war, because of all sorts of things. And now the tables have turned a little bit. Southern Europe has become a place not of emigration as much as immigration, though many Italians, people born in Italy, are still living outside of the country. Same with Germans. There's you know, many millions of German people who were born in Germany are living outside the country. So that doesn't seem to be a problem for them. And yet yeah. when people come to the country, all of a They're sudden- They're expats. Oh, They're oh, expats. Oh, 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 oh. As opposed exactly. to illegals. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think also one thing that is is typically misrepresented, there's a lot of conversation right now about asylum in Europe. And it is giving rise to the far right because these fears are stoked. Um, but the solution is, is 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 pretty obvious at the same time. And you know, we've seen it actually in effect because people have been coming to the southern Europe increasingly for the last 10 years. And it's not a problem. Actually, when you look at it, it's like there are jobs that are being filled that were not filled earlier. Um, people are assimilating. Crime hasn't gone up despite, you know, people making a lot of hay out of a couple um, individual crimes. In gross numbers, crimes have not gone up. And so like, we don't have to look far for an example of it working. It's already working, actually. Um, Im immigrants are boosting the Italian economy. So like, you know, we don't need to imagine some some future way that we can actually help people settle in. They are already settling in. Of course, they would settle in probably a lot more smoothly. And here we could maybe transition to places like New York or Chicago. Right. If they were not, um, you know, scapegoated, marginalized, if they were given work permits more quickly. And it, even when they're not, they figure things out and things are kind of pretty fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've talked on this program about how, uh, in fact, incre uh, increasing the precarity 
of the living situations for people who are here uh, in, in an undocumented status um, gives employers more leverage over those workers because if they step out of line, there's a, th a threat and they can also get, uh, they're also forced to accept lower wages. Um, so can you speak about how border closure and militancy uh, is a cis is a way to kind of build um a, a exploitative machinery to a degree right i think the best way to think of it is the border acts is sort of like a fiscal fulcrum it is the sort of centerpiece by which corporations can exploit differences differentials in wages in worker protections in unionization rates and you know, if you, like I currently in Arizona, I go down to northern Mexico pretty frequently for reporting and for, you know, whatever, because I can cross the border at ease. And there are a lot of, of factories that are effectively modern day sweatshops. They're, you know, they're called maquiladoras or maquilas for short. And the only reason that they exist is because of the border and the way that the border is able to keep or like lock a certain number of people in place in northern Mexico and use their labor to produce stuff that we want to buy or that we want to sell in the United States. And, you know, we saw the rise of this in, you know, probably the listeners are already sort of make, connecting the dots to NAFTA. This is when we, we really saw the border exploited in this way, when we decided to open up for free trade, um, most of North America, and yet further lockdown because what happened in lockstep with the the opening of nafta was further border militarization i mean at the exact same time congress was passing laws and starting to build what we now see as like the the incipient wall infrastructure that we're seeing along the border so if people were able to move freely if people were able to go where they were able to make higher wages we wouldn't be able to exploit them and you know um, Justin Akers Chacon, who does great work on all this issue, he has a, has a recent good book called The Border Crossed Us. He actually counted the number of free trade organizations, free trade agreements that have any um, provisions for the free movement of labor. So right now there's about 400 free trade agreements throughout the world. That's, that's tracked by the World Trade Organization. And only 40 of those, as of a couple of years ago, had any provisions for the free movement of labor. And those were for only highly specialized fields. So what we, it comes down to is that the stuff that we buy and the money that is used to buy it has far more rights than a lot of the people that used to make it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think like when you look at just actually what's happening along the northern border, the northern uh, Mexican borders, like shouldn't people have the same rights as your toaster oven as your television that they're building that can go back and forth and actually sometimes do multiple times in their production and that people can't. You know, this, it seems like obviously not only fundamentally unfair, but fundamentally exploitative. That's well, absolutely. And it, you can also draw a line as well to the decline in union density in the United States to, the, to this uh, push for free trade, which is what these borders enable. And uh, just the, the, the fact that the TPP, which was widely criticized, obviously, um, and, and Obama ended up having to, to walk away from it, and Hillary Clinton as a candidate, too, um, was the fact that it created these essentially outside tribunals where if a, if a, if a government was going to uh, create a regulation that would impose corporate profits, um, there... The, uh, there corporations have the ability to go kind of over over that and have a tribunal to determine whether or not this was uh, a, a regulation that ma made sense. So it was it's not just that our free trade deals um, put our, our, our workers at such a uh, lower class, too, but it also elevated corporations over the power of states. At least in theory, it didn't end up happening. But I just I always am. Um, in awe of, of the fact that that was a, 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 a almost happened, uh, honestly. Well, well, I mean, it, it is also happening. I mean, there yeah. are, um, there are, there's a dispute settlement court where um, parties, including corporations, can bring countries um, to suit 
if they don't let them basically implement or l let them have free reign and, and do what they what they will. There's a, a recent article about this in The Intercept that a bunch of like the Bitcoin bros are taking Honduras to court because they're not allowed to operate there. Yeah, um, we you know, interviewed one, someone on that, right? Yeah. yeah. What, one other point to make here is, you know, um, I grew up in in sort of like suburban Ohio and a lot of the factories where like my 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 friend's dad's worked or like my uncle's worked are now closed and those closures followed on the heels of NAFTA and a lot of those jobs went to northern Mexico and there's one place in particular that just like is I think such an affront to those people is there's a former um, huge steel, the place of a former huge steel factory um, outside of Cleveland that has been rebranded the steel yard. And there's like a giant target and like raw shoes and like all these things selling stuff that is made outside of the United States where workers in the United States used to actually make this stuff. So like a lot of people complaining about the border and supposed invasion or whatever, and the people coming to take jobs, those people lost their jobs because of bordering actually. Bordering is not good for jobs actually anywhere, but in particularly in places where there's been decently paid manufacturing jobs. So uh, 